In today's discussion, we'll be talking about how to take history properly in AMC clinical exam. Now, one thing that I must tell you is many of us who have practiced for many years back in our countries, perhaps have been taking history and we might feel that, okay, I have been doing this for so long, I must not have any problem doing this. But what we have to remember is in the course of our practice, as we get more experienced, we develop our own system, we develop our own shortcuts, and then we don't take history as we are expected to take in AMC clinical exam. In AMC clinical exam, you are expected to take history as an intern level student would do. Therefore, to take history properly, you may need to learn some new tricks, relearn some of the things that you already knew but you are not doing any longer, or unlearn some of the things that you have been doing. And that's what my approach will be in today's video. I'll be doing this video in two parts. And after the first part, if you feel like this is something that you'd be interested in, please let me know in the comments so that I can work on the second video as well. The other thing is, if you think these videos are helping you to prepare for the exam, please like the video, subscribe to my channel and share it with your friends as well. It will help me to stay motivated and make more videos. So let's just start today's discussion now. Now, as I told you, we are asked to take um, history in different ways in our exam. So what are those different ways? Let's talk about that first. History taking in AMC clinical exam is done for different length of time, depending on the task type given in the exam. The first one is the comprehensive history taking. Usually in comprehensive history taking, you are given six minutes to take history. One of the characteristic of this kind of question is the stem will be quite short. So you will get a short stem. And most of the time, the other task or the only task after history taking will be diagnosis or differential diagnosis. The main purpose of this kind of history taking is to assess your ability to take a focus history to make a provisional diagnosis and differential diagnosis. So they want to see whether you are familiar with all aspects of history taking, all steps of history taking. The second kind of history taking question which are commonly asked in your exam is what we call focused history taking. So focused history taking, you will get three minutes for this kind of history taking and one prominent feature of this kind of history uh, history taking task is the stem will be long so you will get a long stem and usually there will be multiple clues so you will be able to make the diagnosis from the stem itself and that is the reason why they are giving you long stem because they want you to make the diagnosis the purpose of history taking will be either to assess the compliance of the patient to the medication, to assess the features of complications, or to find out why the patient is presenting now, or to validate the diagnosis. So usually the main purpose is not the diagnosis itself, but to find more information related to that particular diagnosis. And the other tasks that often come with this is, you might be asked to do a focused physical examination in this case after taking history, or maybe interpret the investigations or maybe counsel the patient about certain questions they have and so on. So some examples of this kind of um, question is like there is an alcoholic patient who has come to you. Now you have to take focus history for three minutes and then after that you'll have to counsel the patient. That's one example of this question. So these two kinds of history taking questions are quite common in your exam. There is a third category and this is the category i don't have any specific name for this but this is the category where you will have four to five minutes to take history and then after that you will be given other tasks um, sometimes the task will be again to interpret the investigations most often i have seen that in these kind of questions first you'll take history for four to five minutes and then you will be shown either the results of investigations or findings of physical examination and after that you'll be asked to do the diagnosis and differential diagnosis or talk to the patient or um, talk about the management of the case and so on. So these are the three different kinds of history taking questions you get in the exam and you need to make sure that you are able to take history in all these three different ways. So what is the best way to start your preparation for history taking. Start by learning comprehensive history taking and then learn how to truncate it, how to shorten it in the given time according to the task in this team. So let's get back to our notes here. How should we start history taking in AMC exam? 
always start with your open-ended questions. One of the tendencies that I've seen while interacting with some candidates is whenever the patient gives a chief complaint, they start elaborating the chief complaint straight away. When you do that, then the role players will only answer your question because that's how they are instructed to perform their part. And you can find information about this in handbook as well. The handbook says that in many places in the handbook, in the instructions to the role player, you'll find that do not share the information voluntarily to the candidate. If the candidate starts asking questions, closed questions too early in the interview, then do not share this information and so on. The reason you should start with open-ended statement is all the role players have an opening statement. Now, depending on the instruction given to them, the opening statement quite, can be quite long and elaborate, containing multiple clues, which can guide you to um, history taking further, or can just be a short sentence where they might just repeat whatever is in this thing. Now, some of the candidates might share with you that, yeah, I asked the role player a question and they just gave me the same thing that I already knew from the STEM and then I wasted my time. And that may give you the impression, oh, that means I should be asking focused questions from early in the interview. And that is not the case. Different role players are instructed in different ways to share uh, the amount of information with you. And depending on that, they will decide how much to tell you. However, you should always start with an open statement because then those candidates who have been asked to share more information with you will have an opportunity to share that information with you. That is the reason why you should start with a simple statement such as, hi, my name is Dr. Roman. I'm one of the general practitioners in this clinic. How can I help you today? Especially if you are dealing with a new patient. And if you're dealing with a regular patient, it's better to address the patient by their name and then start your open-ended questions. Like you can say, how is everything? Or what brings you here today? How can I help you today? This is not a very big thing, but differentiating between new patient and regular patient shows to the examiner that you are reading the stem carefully and you are responding to the stem rather than just using your memory of the recall. That means you're adjusting your response according to the stem. The other thing is, in many questions, you may not know the name of the patient. And if you don't know the name of the patient, <coughs> it's always a good idea to ask the patient how you can address them. So you can ask them like, how can I address you? And if they tell you the name, then in that case, write that name down on your note paper, the paper that you will be using in your exam. How can I address you today? Or um, may I know your name, please? Now, asking about the name of the patient is really important in pediatrics cases. You should ask mother what is the name of her child or father, uh, depending on who you are dealing with. You should ask what is the name of the child. And when you are talking to the patient, use the name of the child as often as you can. And for the purpose of not forgetting it later, write it down on the notebook or the paper that you're the scrap paper that you're using. Okay, it's really important. It's a softer skill, but it's really important in the exam. And it's one of the key points, especially in pediatrics cases. So the first important thing in history taking is start with the open-ended question, get the opening statement from the role player, and based on the information shared by the role player, decide the further structure of your history. Just because the question that you have got in the exam is similar to the recall, don't go on asking the question that you have in mind. Try to modify your questioning structure based on the opening statement given by the role player. This is one place where many people make the mistake of asking the preformed question in their head. They are too biased and because of that, they will not get the positive points that the patient has. After this, the second part is elaboration of the history of presenting illness. Now, different people have different structures for this. In my case, I use Socrates. Now, Socrates is a formula, is a mnemonics that people use for pain cases, basically, but I use it in other <coughs> chief complaint as well, because it helps me to remember the relevant questions to ask in a structured and orderly manner. So Socrates stands for site, onset, character, radiation, associated symptoms, trigger and timing, exacerbating and alleviating factors and severity of the symptom. Now, in case of pain, most of us may have already practiced how to ask these questions, but let's say that someone is coming with tiredness, how will you start it? So you cannot ask about sight, right? But you can ask about onset. When did it start? Did it start suddenly or gradually? Do you feel physically tired or mentally tired? That will be the character. 
Radiation will not be important. So what you do is you modify Socrates according to the presenting complaint and you ask the relevant questions until you reach the point of associated symptoms. And in the associated symptoms here, try to ask the questions which can help you to rule out the differential diagnosis or which can help you to rule in the provisional diagnosis. If someone is presenting with a complaint of tiredness, we have a formula that we use when we are taking history in tiredness case, hemifarox C. So you can ask trigger and timing. Many times they will say that it started two months ago, two weeks ago, one week ago. You need to ask the patient, do you think anything that you were doing at that time may have led to this? For example, in the case of panic disorder, the patient might say that they had this chest pain and then a shortness of breath. And when they when you ask them, what were you doing at that time? They might share with you that they were watching TV and on TV they saw something violent and that triggered the episode. Or in case of a PTSD patient, they might tell you that they saw something similar to the incident that happened to them earlier and that triggered the episode and so on. So that's why triggering and timing, this is important. And the other question that you can ask in timing is, is this happening for the first time or it has happened to you earlier as well? So that is also something that will give you idea about the chronicity of the problem and how much the patient understands about the problem. If this is something that has been happening to the patient for a long time, they might be able to tell you the treatment they have already tried so that um, you can consider those factors when you'll be talking about the management of the cases later. As I told you, triggers and timing can be quite important to guess about the diagnosis because in your exam there are some common triggers which will start some common chief complaints of the patient. Let me give you some of the triggers that I can remember right now. The first one is emotional stress. So there is an emotional stress or there is some kind of lifestyle stress or problems at home which starts the cases of depression or the cases of anxiety, panic disorder or recent infection. This is another one that will often be present. For example, someone presenting with limping may have a history of recent infection. Someone presenting with chest pain that is positional, which is something you will get in pericarditis, or someone who has had infection recently, and then after that they have started having this cough and it's not going away. Maybe it's a post-viral cough. Someone had some kind of throat infection recently and now they are feeling very tired could be a case of infectious mononucleosis leading to chronic fatigue syndrome. So these are some of the common triggers which can give you clues. Recent travel. Some of the cases we get in exam are COVID cases, uh, dengue cases, or tuberculosis. We haven't, we haven't had any tuberculosis cases in the exam so far, as much as I know. Um, but uh, this is one of the relevant thing. Or malaria. Again, this is just a relevant question to ask, but in the exam, I don't know if they have asked about malaria recently. Starting a new medication, so they start a new medication and now they have the symptom like the patient presenting with the complaint of cough and because they have started ACE inhibitor recently or trauma. Trauma often is a trigger for many presenting complaints like they had a fall and then after that they started having pain on their wrist. So most likely the problem is scaphoid fracture that was not diagnosed at that time. So asking about when did it start and what were you doing at that time? What could be the trigger is really important. The other thing is the timing. This is the first time that you are having these symptoms or you have had these symptoms before as well. There are some symptoms which get better with certain things patients do and that gives you the clue. For example, if someone is presenting with chest pain that gets better when they lean forward, you immediately think of acute pericarditis. Okay, let's talk about exacerbating and relieving factors. They can give you some clues about the possible diagnosis. As an example, in acute pericarditis case, the patient will tell you that when they lean forward, they have less pain. And then you get the idea that, okay, it's perhaps acu acute pericarditis. Of course, there will be other important clues as well. Or if someone says that whenever I try to breathe, then I get the pain, then you think about pneumothorax. And just like that, you will get more ideas. If I, uh, if I lie still on the bed, then I don't get the pain. If I try to move, then I get the pain, abdominal pain. Then you know that most likely it's peritonitis. So that's why you should ask exacerbating and relieving factors. In case of pain, you can ask them if they are in pain right now and if they need any pain medications after ruling out their allergies to any pain medications. You can also ask them if they have already tried any kind of pain medication and if that helped or not, because then you can decide how bad the pain is. If someone says that, I have had this back pain um, 
which is started suddenly two hours ago and I have already taken Panadol and then it's not going away and it's uh, radiating towards the groin, then it, you are getting the clue based on the fact that the pain is not being relieved by Panadol and it's radiating that most likely it will be due to the kidney stone. That's why you should ask this question. The last point in Socrates is severity. And while asking questions about severity, there are a few things I want you to think about. The first is the impact on their life. If it's a pain case, you will use pain score. You will simply ask on a scale of 0 to 10. That's a subjective um, assessment of the pain by the patient himself or herself, which will help you to understand how severe the pain is. In case of other symptoms, you can ask, how is it affecting your life? Do you have the symptoms during the sleep as well? Sleep and life. These two things, if you ask, you'll be able to understand the severity of the symptoms and you can address these issues when you'll be doing the management part. So make a habit of asking these two questions. If the patient says the pain is so severe that they cannot sleep, what it means is most likely it's a serious condition and it's not psychogenic. Okay, this question is very relevant when the patient's presenting complaint is pain, itching, cough, urination, shortness of breath. If they are waking up frequently during the night time to go to the toilet, it could be a case of new case of diabetes. It could be prostatic enlargement. So it gives you an idea about something serious going on, something that is organic rather than psychogenic because psychogenic case uh, symptoms usually tend to disappear when patients sleep. So I hope this has given you some insight into how to do history taking. In the rest of the history taking uh, video, uh, I'll be talking about the rest of the things you should do in history taking. If you feel like this is something you already know and you don't want me to discuss these things, I'll not make the second video and rather I'll focus on some other topics. But if you think that you want to listen to me talking about these things and want to have a discussion about these things please let me know in the comments if based on your feedback we might do another live session about how to take a proper history in AMC clinical exam until my next video stay safe thank you